the wonderful love of Jesus. I had two young men and two young preachers in my office this past week, and what a testimony they are. It was a great joy to have Nikki Cruz and Sonny Argonzoni in my office. Nikki Cruz was the Mama gang leader, gave his heart to Christ. He'd been saved 30 years in preaching. He was the, uh, one of the key characters in the Cross and Switchblade uh, story. And Sonny Argonzoni was the first drug addict uh, we reached for the Lord when we came to New York City three years ago. Nicky was on his way to a crusade in London. He travels all over the world preaching to thousands, and I'll never forget how the love of Jesus touched him. I, every time I go past Fort Greene Projects here in Brooklyn, I get a lump in my throat. I was 115 pounds, 28 years old. But feeling the love of Jesus just rushing to me that Jesus had for drug addicts, alcoholics, prostitutes. And I walked into this city and I uh, drove in rather 1957 green Chevrolet, slept in the car. I sure wouldn't do it now knowing what I know. But I slept in a car and put newspapers against the window. Found out the worst gang in New York City at that time. In fact, they, they had over, over uh, 300 gangs listed by youth department at that time, 1958. And I went down to, to find the Mile Miles. And they were staying against the fence in their red jackets with big double M's. 28 kids had been murdered in 1958 in gang fights. And I remember going up to one young man. His name was Israel the president of the gang, and he was very kind, shook hands, and uh, said, hey, preach, you're okay. I, he had listened to me preach for about five minutes. I went to shake hands with Nicky Cruz, and he spit on me, slapped my face, and said, go to hell. I'll never forget that stinging on my face. And I, all I could burn out, I, I don't think I did it in anger, Nicky, Jesus loves you, and walked away thinking, Lord, I know you love him, but I don't know if you can save him. He's the hardest. I don't like to be slapped. I don't like to be spit on. Nicky Cruz could get that out. It was like a stuck record, broken record. All night long, Nicky, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. He hated police. He hated everybody else. Some of you have heard his testimony. Nicky, Jesus loves you. And folks, to sit in my office and look at that young man on his way to London, having reached thousands and thousands around the world, five girls... Five children, I think uh, two or three in Bible school, and all called to some kind of ministry. Nikki going on with the Lord. All I could say is, Jesus, your love finds them. Your love is everlasting. Nikki never told me, never knew what the love of Jesus was and what Christ had done for him until his little girl, his first little child, came to hear him in one of his crusades, and he was telling the story of all the terrible things he did, went home, and she wouldn't talk to him. He said, what's the matter, honey? She said, you are a bad man. I don't want to talk to you. That's not my daddy. <laughs> and it hurt him. He didn't realize till then uh, how God had changed, how the love of Jesus had manifested itself so much in his life. Sonny Arkansas, I met 28 years or, or 30 years ago down in Brooklyn under the elevated train right off the Williamsburg Bridge. And I, I went up to him in front of a pizza shop. And I, he was a drug addict just waiting for his contact. Found out his name. I said, Sonny, Jesus loves you. He said, man, get off the block. My mom's one of those hallelujah people. And she's a, one of those tongue-talking hallelujahs. You sound like one. I said, yes, I am. But I, I remember saying, Sonny, Jesus sent me down here because he loves you. Sonny had been in and out of jail, in and out of prison. His mother would see him dirty, filthy, and ragged on the street and say, Sonny, please, just come home, change your shirt, let me give you a clean meal. He said, Mama, go home. Didn't want anything to do with, with family, had no thoughts of God, been shot at, in and out of prison. But I'll never forget the day. He came remembering that invitation to come to the center, remembering that, that, just that one statement, Nikki, or rather Sonny, Jesus loves you. His love will find you. And the love of Jesus found Sonny when he came in and heard Nikki preach at our center down here in Brooklyn. And he thought that, he thought Nikki, while he was preaching, someone had gone to him, told him all about him because Nikki was preaching his life. And Sonny sunk down in his seat because he heard his whole story being told. And Nicky Cruz goes over to Sonny, lays hands on him and said, God, save him and call him to preach. And Sonny thought, me, preach? 
a drug addict, a killer at heart. Oh, but folks, I set my office this past week. Sonny Argonzoni is not only a pastor, he's a bishop of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. They've got churches all over America. In fact, he was in Philadelphia helping set up another one of their churches. In their, in their conferences, they have three, 4,000, all of them converted drug addicts, alcoholics, prostitutes. Sonny Argonzoni is a preacher of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the love of Christ was manifested in him. Now see, there are many of you here tonight. You know what I'm talking about because up, up here you fellas from, drug, from, from the drug life, alcoholics. Many of you, not even in Teen Child, maybe other programs. Some of you here may be in business. You were a drug addict, you were an alcoholic, you were drinking, you were lost, you were hopeless. But the love of Jesus Christ came to you. Manifested itself to you. How, how beautiful wasn't it, the love of Jesus when you first heard of it? What a flush of glory when you realized that in spite of what you'd done, Jesus loved you. And you rejoiced in that love. You went a long time just basking in that love. And then you started going around telling everybody how Jesus loved them. Some of you have been witnessing. You've been saved five years, ten years. But what's happened since then? Many of you have backslidden about the love of Jesus for yourself. Somehow along the line, you, you, you got the idea... That because you have allowed a coldness or a failure into your life, that you can preach Jesus and his love to others, but you can't appropriate it to yourself. Now this is where I'm going with the message tonight. I want to talk about his love for you as a Christian. His love for you as a believer and for me. You know, I was preaching a number of years ago in Harlem in a street meeting, and I was going through a very difficult time in our ministry. Very, very difficult. Gwen had cancer. And in fact, I think this was her second cancer she had back in the hospital. And I had the burden of teen challenge and it was weighing heavy on me. Traveling, trying to raise funds. Trying to keep the whole thing afloat. And centers, cities all over the country calling. And, and I was absolutely at the end of my rope at this particular time. I, I, and in, in my burden and in my struggle over, I, I got so burdened over needs, I went down to about 115 pounds. Skin and bone, it just, there was no joy because I was so burdened down by the needs of the city. And in that, I, I shut Gwen out. And in her pain, she, she, she couldn't stand being cut out from my life. It, it wasn't that, I don't, I don't think I was a bad husband or anything, but I didn't really bring her into the burden that was on my heart. I should have shared it with her. And we were going through a rather difficult time. And I remember one day just losing my temper and going off for a street meeting. And I felt so dirty and so unclean. Has that ever happened to you? Where, you know, you want God with all your heart. You love him with everything that's in you. And, and you fast, you pray, you seek him, but suddenly, there it is, just like a flood. It just comes and hits you and sweeps you off your feet. You lose your temper, you do something stupid, and you feel dirty and unclean and filthy. And I had to go up into Harlem, and I'm standing there in my pain, and I'm preaching my heart out. Jesus loves you. I don't care what you did. Drugs, alcohol, prostitute. Come on up, Jesus loves you. Give your heart to him. And after I preached this profound message, I thought, how Jesus could love anybody on the streets. I'm standing there after the meeting in despair watching drug addicts and alcoholics with our personal workers drinking in the love of Jesus. And suddenly, in my despair, my head down, feeling so low, the Holy Spirit said to me, David, why don't you appropriate some of that love you've been preaching for yourself? Why don't you let me love you? What gives you the idea that you can just preach it and not practice it, not appropriate it to yourself? And friends, from that day to this, there are many times I've had to just step back and say, Jesus, I've been out preaching it. I tell the whole world that you can save body, anybody from anything. Now, Jesus, come and love me. Amen. Love me. I remember one time when uh, one of Gwen's last uh, times in the hospital, she was so wiped out. She, she had uh, lupus, and had, had about 30 pounds of water on her and, and was in the hospital. 
And she, she had said, David, this is enough. I can't, after all these operations of cancer, this is just too much. And she went in the hospital just at the end of her rope. And I went to a hotel room near the hospital. And I said, oh, God, when does this ever stop? Lord, I love you. I see there's no, I can't figure it out. It, 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 she can't go through much more pain. And, you know, I said, Lord, give me something. And, you know, it's not a good idea to just say, Lord, give me something and open your Bible. Because you know where it fell? It fell in Jeremiah. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You know what you know, I did? I closed it and said, no, Lord, not today. I, I'm hurting enough. And you know what the Lord whispered in my heart? David, just lay still let me love you. So help me, the Holy Ghost brought Jesus his presence in that room, and he put his arms around me and began to love me. And I said, Jesus, now love Gwen. And, and then the Holy Spirit put a scripture, a Psalms, so and so and I went there. And you know what it said? He makes all wars to cease. I said, that's it. That's it. He's making all cease. I ran to the hospital. Gwen was dressed. He said, David, I'm healed. I'm getting out of here. Let's go home. I have victory. It was the love. The absolute love of Jesus Christ being manifested. The Bible said the husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. You can't counsel other people that they, they are loved without appropriating that love for yourself. Now, there, there are some of you here that love Jesus dearly, but you're not persuaded that Jesus Christ loves you. You preach to others. You, you, you picture yourself, though, as... as having failed the Lord, and he's cast aside as a result of it. I want to speak directly to you tonight. I, I really believe God put this on my heart, and it's why I struggled so much with all the imps of hell to get through. But here's, I was laying on my face last night, and God began to speak clearly to me, to speak directly to those who be here tonight who felt that you've let the Lord down. You feel you've let the Lord down. You've not lived up to the standard you've heard preached in this pulpit or wherever it may be. Now, friends, if you've been coming to this church, we hold up a high standard. We preach a strong message of righteousness and holiness. And many of you feel that you can't live up to that, that you failed the Lord somehow. It's not that we've been putting a heavy trip on you. We're, we're trying to preach what we believe is the standard of the Word of God. But in your striving to be more like Jesus, you've failed the Lord. You've sinned somehow. And you sit here this, after, this evening with failure in your life. You have tripped. You have fallen. Satan has bruised your heel. Now remember, that's what the scriptures, in, in, it was originally said, that the serpent will bruise your heel. And when serpent bruises your heel, does not mean you're damned or you're lost or outside of the love of Jesus. He's bruised your heel. But there's healing for that. But now you're here tonight and you're living with guilt and condemnation. You can't see how Christ can still love you because deep in your heart you know you may have grieved the Holy Spirit and you, you somehow walk right into the devil's trap or you're still in the satanic snare. But I want you to know, friends, and listen closely, you and I were reconciled to God when we were still enemies. When we were out in sin, not even thinking of God, Jesus loved us. Let me read it to you. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, yet sinners, we weren't even thinking of him. When you were out there, do you remember when you were out there? Do you remember when you had no time of, for him? Do you remember those days? And the Lord said, even then I loved you. Even then you were reconciled to me if you would have only repented and come. While you were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. The Lord saying, if I loved you when you were out there not even thinking about me, do I not love you now when you're going through a struggle? When your heart still loves me? Now, I'm not talking about those who have just put God aside. They've given themselves over to their sin. They don't want anything to do with God. They're not interested in repentance. I'm talking about Christians and others who have backslidden somehow. In fact, the closer you get to Jesus, the least thing will seem big to you in the sight 
in your own eyes. You'll feel the grief of having grieved the Lord. Now, I don't have anything profound tonight, but I want to share you just a few things that the Holy Spirit's putting in my heart about His love. First of all, God wants us to be fully persuaded, fully persuaded that nothing, absolutely nothing, can separate us from the love of Jesus Christ. I want you to go. Why don't you go to Romans 8? Why don't you go to Romans 8? The 8th chapter, verse 38. Beginning to read. Do you have it? Romans 8, 38. Oh, I love the word, don't you? For I am, this is Paul speaking, I am persuaded. I'm completely convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing shall separate us from the love of God. Now that's the truth that the devil doesn't want us to be convinced of. He doesn't want you to hear that. He doesn't want you to know it. Because here, I want you to know something. If you can come, if you can get a hold of this truth, you can come through any trial. You can come through your temptation you're going through now in your trial. You can come through any failure and be more than a conqueror if you're fully persuaded that Jesus loves you. Look, look, look at verse 5. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? For it's written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. You're conquered through the love of Jesus Christ for you. Look at me, folks. The cry of this book is be rooted and grounded in love that you may be able to endure. Yeah. You may be able to stand in a troubled time, rooted and grounded in love. Yeah. I'm afraid we're not rooted, we're not grounded in the love of Jesus Christ. Many of us, we're afraid to appropriate it. Philippians 1, 6, don't turn, says, being confident of this, that he that hath begun a good work in you will perfect it to the day of Jesus Christ. When you came to the Lord, now listen closely to me, you came to the Lord. He decided he'd not let you go. Listen to me now. You came to the Lord, and it was known in heaven and hell and earth that Jesus paid for you with his own blood. And he put a stamp on you, and he engraved you in the palm of his hand, and he said, devil, this child belongs to me. Now, no matter what problem you're going through, no matter what failure you're at, if you'll confess it and repent, you'll come back by his love. You'll be drawn back by his love. You'll be drawn back by his precious love. He that's begun a good and work in you will perfect it till the day of Christ. You're not going to let the devil interrupt his work in you. Satan's lying to some of you right now. He's trying to tell you that Jesus has given up on you. He's telling you that Jesus is mad at you. That you're just wicked and evil, you'll never amount to anything, you'll never be holy, you'll never be clean. You can hit, hear, hear Brother Bob preach, you can hear me, hear Gary, hear one of the pastors preach and say, oh, I'll never, I can't measure up. There's no way I'm going to measure up. Everybody else is measuring up, but I'm not measuring up. Have you ever sat here thinking you're the only one going through problems, only one having a problem? Anybody sitting here right now thinking you're the only one with failure in your life? You say, but what's, are you going to do it? Uh, one of those TV evangelist things on us? No, I'm not. I'm not standing here in any known failure in my life. But there are some of you sitting here now and the devil lying to you right now. He's saying, see, you tried and you can't make it. Bob did hit this so strong this morning. And here you sit wondering if you should even go on. We've had people leave this church. They have absolutely quit on the Lord because they say, I can't make it. I can't. I, I will never measure up to what he wants. I want you to know that God's given you a word. You can take it right to the devil and you can throw it right at him just as Jesus did in the wilderness and the devil's going to run. It's right there in the 8th chapter of Romans. Look at it. The 34th verse. 34th. Who is he that condemneth? Well, you know who that is, don't you? Were you condemned this afternoon before you came to church? Have you been sitting here doing the worship being condemned? We, we've got... We've got a Tom condemner who stands before the throne of God, accuser of the brethren, trying to accuse you, saying, you'll never make it. But who is this that condemneth? 
It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. You stand right up against Satan. And you can say this with everything in you. I refuse your condemnation and your lies. Jesus paid for my sins. I repent. Jesus loves me. I, I'm on his mind right now. In fact, devil, right now when you're accusing me, he has me on his mind. He has me on his lips. He's talking to the Father about me right now. He's talking to the Father about me. This very moment, he's interceding before the Father. And you can tell the devil that. Glory be to God. And then you can quote him this scripture. I write unto you that you sin not. But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. You go back to him. You say, Father, I've sinned. I've had four children and I never kicked them out because they failed me. I took them aside. Sometimes I had to take them to the woodshed. Sometimes I had to spank the meanness out of them. But all along they were my children and I loved them. And the only reason I spanked them was for their own good. When did Jesus throw you out? Tell me. When did he write a bill of a divorcement? Say, I divorce you. Go on out on your own. When did he do it? You can't tell me when he did that. He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll go with you to the end. I'm going through you with your troubles. I'm going through your trial. Hold fast. Now, notice a very interesting verse, Romans 8.35. Look at it. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Now, who is a person, isn't that? And you know who that is. That's Satan. But then look, shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword. Now, those are things. That's not a who. Those are things. Who is it that brings these things on us? Satan himself trying to bring all these things to rob us of the love of God. But I notice, look down in verse 37. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Hallelujah. Now, to separate us, who shall separate us from the love of Jesus Christ? That word separation is to isolate. In other words, to make you feel like an island of rejection. That you're not loved. And I'll tell you what the devil does. He'll first try to strip you of love of those around you. He'll try to interfere in the love of your family. Interfere in the love of your friends. And try to isolate you. In fact, the separation means to put a great gulf between it and isolate it as an island. Some of you sitting here right now knowing what that means. You have felt rejection. You felt isolated. And you, 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 feel what, you feel just what they felt in Israel. It says, but Zion has said, the Lord hath forsaken us, and my Lord hath forsaken, forgotten me. Can a woman forget her sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of her own womb? Yea, they may forget Yet I'll not forget you. Behold, I've graven you on the palm of my hand. Your walls are continually before me. And then in Hosea it says, I will heal their backslidings. I will love them freely, for mine anger is turned away from him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Friends, God wants to heal every backslider here tonight. He wants to offer you his love and to heal that backsliding of your heart. Now, the Holy Spirit has really been putting me under conviction about the danger of presenting Jesus as a hard man. Do you remember that parable? There were three servants that were given talents. One was given ten, one was given five, and one was given one talent. And the man who had the one talent went and hid it in the earth. And one day the master comes and calls him to account. And he said, I, I want what I gave you. I want my return. And you know what he said? Master, I knew thee that thou art a hard man. And I was afraid. And I went and I hid my talent. And I was on my face before God. And the Lord was saying, David, there's something you're not hearing, you're not seeing yet. And I want to tell you, I don't believe you can be a holiness preacher of any kind. You can't be a preacher of righteousness unless you're teachable. And I'm telling you now, God's telling me I've got a lot to learn. And I confess it before you here now, and I'm not trying to be sentimental or put attention on myself. But God began to say, there's so much yet I've got to learn before I can be a shepherd to, this, to the sheep here even. All of us as pastors are, are open that God would teach us. But I got to thinking, Lord was showing me, what, what kind of teacher did this man have? The other two served the Lord with joy. 
They had no problem. They made their investment. It was a glorious experience. But this man comes and he said, boy, you're hard. And he was afraid and he hid his talent. Who was his teacher? What kind of message did he sit under that made him see Jesus as hard? Because Jesus is the master here. Brother Bob had to, he, he felt the same grief that I felt one time when, when some people that sat under his teaching had, had gone to a pastor and tried to correct him as if, you know, they knew it all now because they'd come into a holiness message. And Bob was alarmed and he got on the phone. He says, tell me, did my preaching produce that in you? And there was terror in Bob and in my own heart. Are, are, are we going to preach a message that would produce that kind of thing? Are they misjudging what is being said? And I got to thinking, Lord, what kind of a, a pastor, what kind of a teacher, what kind of a message was he sitting under that he perceives Jesus as a hard man? A Friday night, a young pastor met me back. I don't know if he's here tonight or not. And tears in his eyes, visiting from another state. And he said, Brother Dave, I've been preaching holiness in my church, and I preach it hard. And he said, the people are not receiving it, and they're leaving left and right. But I can't compromise on my message. And I felt pain in my heart, because all over the country now, there, there, there's a message of holiness coming forth. There's a message of righteousness. But folks, too many are preaching it as hardness. They're not presenting Jesus in fullness. I remember something Bob told me that changed my life. He said, David, when we preach holiness, we must never veil Christ. We must never veil the mercy of Jesus Christ. But you see, I, I don't want to be that hard man or, or, or that man that preaches a message that pictures Jesus only as a hard man because that produces fear and fear has torment and then people go and hide. Because they feel they can't make it. I don't want to be one of those preachers. You know, there are times when I, well, when I have to preach a strong message, a prophetic message especially. I know that there are some people that are out there that they're just, they, they want to say, yeah, preach it, Brother Dave. Get it. Hit it. Hit it. Hit it. It's almost like a cheering section. Hit it. And sometimes, Pastor, I know there have been times I've been carried up in it. I confessed to Bob today about a time down in Georgia. I was preaching at a camp meeting two years ago. And I, on that campground, I saw these great big satellite dishes. And you know my hatred for television. The superintendent of the movement there was great big, biggest dish I ever saw. And I'll tell you what, I got up there in that pulpit and boy, I skinned them alive. By the way, the Lord doesn't want hides. He wants souls, you know, skinning i tell you what, I thundered and I, uh, ever since I felt the pain for what I did. And later some pastors said, boy, you were hard, Brother Dave. But you know, there were some people in there just fed something in them. They wanted to hit it. They wanted hard, hard, hard. Now I'm going to tell you now, I'm not going to compromise on my message. I'm going to preach it. But there have been evangelists, you know, that have preached a hard message and you were there watching either on television or something. Yeah, there. give it to them. That's right. And he's, they'll say, I'll not compromise. I'm going to preach and tell it like it is. But I've been hearing the Holy Spirit say to me, David, how are you presenting me to the sheep? Are you showing them my mercy and my love and my long suffering along with my hatred for sin? Are you making them afraid, so afraid that they'll hide? And I want the Lord to help me preach holiness stronger than I've ever preached it, but I want to preach it with brokenness. I want to be like Paul who said, I came to you like in the tenderness of a nurse. I'm going to read it to you. Paul said, but we were gentle among you. Even as a nurse cherisheth her children, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted to you not the gospel of God only, but our also our very souls, because you were dear to us. I confess to you, I've never known that. I'm beginning to know it. I've never passed. I've been an evangelist. And I've thundered all over the world. I don't think I know what it's like to be a nurse, to look out over a congregation of people living in a wicked city, hurting, carrying all kinds of burdens and garbage from your past. And I, wanted, I want to see you walk in holiness. And all the past, we want to see you walk in holiness so much. 
Now, I, I can't speak for Bob. I know these men. Bob has a tender heart. Gary has a tender heart. I need this. I need to have that gentleness as a nurse, cherish of their children, not trying to spank them because there's a sickness, there's a disease, there's sin. And Paul is saying, I came to you people. My dear sheep is a nurse, cherishes her children. So being affectionate, desirous of you, we're willing to impart to you not just the gospel only, but our very souls because you're dear to us. Paul then added, we exhorted and we comforted and charged every one of you as a father to charge his children. No wonder Paul's message of holiness was received. It wasn't rejected. People didn't walk out here. Because he said, when you received this word of God, which you heard of us, you received it. Not as word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. I told this young preacher what I want to tell every preacher of righteousness and holiness in America. If you're going to be preaching a strong message, preach it through brokenness. Preach it through tears. And folks, that's what I've asked God to do for this pulpit. You may have heard people say, Times Square Church, you go down there and you just get beat. No, you don't get beat here. You won't get beaten here because God's breaking this ministry. He's breaking the hearts of the pastors, telling us that we need to be like Paul. We need to share with you as precious children, not trying to whip you, not trying to drive you, but to go to the throne of God Touch his righteousness. Touch his holiness. See a vision of Jesus so clear. And then come to you and say, here he is. In all of his love, he hates sin. And that's why we preach so strong about it. We feel his wrath against it. And we don't want you to be damned. We love you too much. But to do it as a nurse. To do it as a father with looking with love to his children. And I confess before a holy God I've not had that. I've not had that. But I want it. Make Jesus, present Jesus in his fullness. Sometimes we're like the man who was forgiven a great debt. And then we walk right out and choke somebody who's not living up to our standard. The Bible says of Jesus, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful as your father's also merciful. That's Luke 6.35. Jesus is kind to the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful as your father's also merciful. James said, the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercies. Now God's showing me. He's just pounding in me with love. He, he'd been speaking all week to me, so strong. How serious this matter is, is how, of how we present Jesus to the world. How we present him. Paul said, we are ambassadors for Christ. You know what that means? We represent him. The only thing the world's going to see of Jesus is what we show it. What we show the world of him. There, there's a, down in Brazil, I think it's in Brasilia, there's a cathedral, and there's a, a, one of those uh, glass windows, colored glass, leaded glass windows, and it's, it's, it's Jesus. You see all these people kneeling before him, and Jesus is standing with a great big club in his hand, ready to smite them. And that's their vision of Jesus. That's a perverted view of Jesus. And, and, and those people come there with that great fear of this man in heaven with a club over their head. God's word says he is very pitiful and of tender mercies. And he's saying if you're going to witness out in the street or you're going to counsel anybody, if you're going to talk to people about Jesus, you've got to be a faithful ambassador. You've got to represent me for my, who, who I really am. And what, what the word says, be, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful. Be courteous. Be pitiful, be courteous. First Peter 3 8. Do you know, much of the street preaching here in New York City is very discourteous. Very discourteous. It's confrontational. 
It's mean. Sometimes it's ugly. I, I, I would imagine we've got 10, 15 street preachers here tonight. But if you're a street preacher, or if you're a witness, or you are a counselor, you've got to understand what the Holy Spirit's saying tonight. Be careful. This is an awesome responsibility. How you present Jesus. Are you presenting him in his fullness? Or are you just showing one side of him? You know, uh, Steve and I were walking down 42nd Street a few weeks ago. And Steve was carrying a briefcase. And this street preacher, God bless his heart, up in the 42nd Street here in Broadway. He stopped. We, we, we just, I just stopped to listen. And he said, look at this. Two, me and Steve... Two computer junkies. They got their computer with them. They're so hooked on computers. You know what's in that box? A microphone. This microphone I have right here. With a big box that we carried in. Computer junkies. They're so wrapped up in the world. I mean, he scolded us. To hear that, dear brother, we were headed right down to hell. <laughs> Sliding right down on our computer. We, we were tempted to open the box. What, what, what are you telling them out there? You're shaking an accusing finger in their face. And this Lord who is very pitiful of tender mercies, are you making him out to be a monster? Are you? I don't want to misrepresent Jesus anymore. Be ye also pitiful. Be courteous. Now, look, the Bible said those who sin must be rebuked before all. That's 1 Timothy 5.20. The Bible said we are to exhort and rebuke with all authority, Titus 2.15. Unruly mouths must be stopped. You've got to rebuke them sharply, Titus 1.13. But we're also commanded to rebuke with all long-suffering. Now, that word long-suffering means very lenient, patient, and understanding. You know what the Scripture said? Street preachers, listen. Witnesses, listen. Counselors, listen. Preach the Word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort, which means counsel, with all long-suffering. You're to do it, but you're to do it with pity, compassion, and long-suffering. Paul preached with that long-suffering. He said, I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long-suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Do you know that you're a pattern of his long-suffering? Come on now, tell me it wasn't his long suffering that found you. How patient has he been with you? That, that's what God told me about television too. You know, last time I talked about television here, I did it with the tears in my eyes. I did it with a broken heart. And if I ever tell you again, God hates it, I'm going to tell it to you because I love you and I'm not trying to rail against you. But I, I've got to tell you right now, if it weren't for the long suffering of Jesus, I wouldn't be standing in this pulpit now. Folks, somewhere along the line, uh, I, I would have turned my back somehow, not on the Lord, but something would have crept in. My family would have been disintegrated and everything else, but for the long suffering. I stand here like Paul is a pattern of the patience and the long suffering of Jesus Christ. How long he bore with some of my foolishness. How long he put up with me. And yet he brought me back to this place and I stand now in his holy freedom. How patient he's been with you. Why will you not be patient with others then? Why will you not be patient with those that you deal with all around you? Now, truthfully, the love of Jesus never gives up on people. I want to show it to you, Revelation 3.15. Revelation 3.15. I'm not going to preach much longer. Revelation 3.15. You, you know this, he's talking about the Laodicean church. Don't you know that's the backslidden church? That's the harlot church? Look at verse... Revelation 3.15, the Lord is saying, And I know thy works, speaking the Laodicean church, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would you were either cold or hot. So then because you're lukewarm and not cold or hot, I'll spew you out of my mouth, because thou sayest I'm rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. You don't know that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I'd look this way for just a minute, if you will, please. You, you see... Jesus standing at the door. Well, if I, would you just look at verse 20. He's already told me he's going to spew them out of his mouth, hasn't he? 
Now look what he said. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Listen very closely to me now. It'd be easy. And I, I think there was a time in my ministry I could have stood in a pulpit and I, I, I would have said something like this. Look, there it is in black and white. I'm going to spill you out of my mouth. Folks, is it in your Bible? There it is. In black and white, I'll spill you out of my mouth. You're compromised, you're backslided, you're naked, you're cold, you're lost, you're undone. And God said, I'll spill you out of my mouth. And I had been preaching the truth halfway. Because look at verse 18. There's Jesus. He doesn't want them to be spewed out of his mouth. Look, he's counseled them. He said, please buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich. He doesn't want them to be poor in spirit. And white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. He's trying to cover their shame. He's not trying to expose anything. He's trying to cover it by his blood. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. And for as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. He's offering mercy. He's offering grace. And see, if I had just come and preached, I'll spill you out of my mouth, I would have had Scripture to prove it. But I would not have preached Jesus in his fullness. I would have missed. Behold, I stand at the door of your heart and knock. Before I'll spill you out of my mouth, I'm going to knock on your door. Because I really don't want to spill my mouth. I want to sit down and eat with you. I don't want you standing naked before the world. I want you covered. But see, we give up on our weak brethren. If we're working with people and they fail us, especially after the second or the third time, it usually, I know it's, I've said it so many times. Look, I've tried. I can't waste any more time. He doesn't want God. He knows where I'm at if he wants the Lord. I'll be here, but I'm not going out of my way. I don't think you're going to make it anyhow. Have you said that about your husband or your wife? I don't know what it's going to take. I've prayed and I'm tired of praying. Man, I've done everything I know how to do. There's nothing left. And I mean, most people, do. we just give up on people. I'm so glad Jesus doesn't. I'm so glad Jesus didn't give up on Peter. Peter didn't deny him once. He didn't deny him twice. He, didn't, he denied him three times. He cursed him. He said, I don't even know the man. I don't know him. He told me Satan was after me to try to sift me. He warned me. I heard the word, I was warned, and yet even in spite of the word that I heard, I've been sitting under this kind of ministry, and I went right out and I did something to grieve my Lord. How could I have done it? Does that sound familiar? Come on. Amen. Don't hide. The Holy Spirit knows where you're at. <laughs> oh, but Peter, Peter remembers something Jesus said. And I can, Peter says, oh, the look in his eyes, I'll never forget that look. What was that look? It was a look of love. Because Jesus said, Peter, <laughs> i got to read it to you. Peter, I've prayed for you that your faith fail not. And when you're converted, strengthen your brethren. You know what, Peter? You know what brought him back? I'm convinced of it. Peter's weeping over the hilltops. He's walking up and down the hillside of Judea and said, I've denied him. I've sinned. <laughs> I've grieved the Lord. I shouldn't have done it. I'm his servant. I've preached his gospel. I've laid hands on the sick. I let him down. Oh, but he said something to me. He said he's going to pray for me. He's praying for me. He's praying for me right now. He's praying for me. Do you know that he's doing that right now for you? And for me, he's before the Father. He's praying for us just like he prayed for Peter. And then Peter remembers something else. Jesus said... I'm going to be converted. I'm coming back. And when I come back, I'm going to be an example to my brothers. Strengthen your brothers. I'm going to be an example of his grace. Can't you say that right now to yourself and to the devil and the whole world? Yes, I've grieved him. I've sinned, but I hate it. I despise it. And I know he's interceding for me right now. And he's saying, you come back to me, and when you're converted, I'm going to make you stronger, and I'm going to use you. You're going to be a testimony to me and to your brothers. Hallelujah. 
What kind of love is that? I'm going to close in just a minute. You remember, you remember the prodigal son who just took his belongings and went off and he wound up in a pig pen eating the husk of the pigs? You ever been there? Far? Some of you are there. I, I have to close now, but this is where the Holy Spirit has brought me for tonight. Please hear me, and I don't... I'm not going to do it psychologically or sentimentally or anything else. But I ask the love of Jesus to make it real. Do you know that whole time that prodigal son was out there feeding the pigs? What was his father? His father was looking for him. Waiting for him. See, the Lord won't force himself on you. But he's waiting. All you have to do is like the prodigal son, come to the end of yourself. Say, look, I've had it. I can't carry this guilt, this condemnation. And more than that, my father has everything that I need. Do you know that father was praying for that son? According to the scripture, if you put everything else together, you, you see the picture, the composite picture. And one day he gets up and he comes back. And that's what God wants you to do tonight. You in the balcony here, down on the main floor, you have that burden on you. You've slipped away from the Lord. Your heart's grown cold. You're under condemnation and guilt. Lord said neither. Do. He, he told the woman, I don't condemn you. Go sin no more. Where are your accusers? He's not your accuser tonight. He's your savior. He's your savior. So this, this boy gets up and he heads back home. And before he even gets there, his father sees him and runs after him. You know, the, that's Jesus. That he comes after you, take one step to him, and I mean he'll come to you. The father didn't go up to him and says, you spent every, look at it, I told you it happened. I knew you'd do it. There was a streak in you, it's been there all the time. You're a brother, you're older brother, you ought to be like him. Stayed right here faithful. Well, that's not what he told him. What'd he do? He fell on his neck and kissed him. He saw his dirty clothes and he said to his servants, take those clothes, put new clothes on his back. Lord said, I'm going to make you a righteous person. I'm going to clean you up. The Lord's master said, take off those filthy shoes. He put new shoes on him. And the, the, the boy said, but I'm not worthy. Master, Father, I failed you. I've sinned against you. I've sinned against God. I'm not worthy. In other words, Lord, let me stay out here till I work my way in. I've got to earn your respect now. No, the Father said, right into the house. And he had a feast with him. Put on a feast. Why? Because the prodigal son could say, I've sinned against God, I've sinned against you, and I'm not worthy. And when you come to that place, then you come to the feast. He doesn't want you just camping outside. He wants you at his table tonight. Kill the fatted calf. and says, come on home. My son who is dead is alive again. Hallelujah. Some of you have been dead. God's going to resurrect you tonight. Hallelujah. Well, I told you, it's very simple. Per, bow your heads. Oh, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Show us your love tonight. How you're reaching out in love tonight to say, if you'll get up out of your despair, if you just get up out of your flesh, get up out of this thing that has a hold of you and come to me I'll receive you I'll make you righteous all you have to do is get up and come come home come home come home Lord Jesus I feel your love tonight for this people truly you love us you love us with an undying love Holy Spirit, just come and put your arms around the sinner here tonight. Put your arms around the backslider. Put your arms around those that are struggling with the weight, saying, I can't take it anymore. I, I'm bound by this thing and I want to be free and I don't know how to get free. Lord, put your arms around them and by your Spirit, just draw them. And tonight, break every chain that binds them and set them free. If God, by His Spirit, touched you tonight, and the Holy Spirit has said, this message is for you, and you've, you've been backslidden in heart, or you're carrying a load of sin or guilt or a habit. And you read one verse.
to put a foundation for my message, and we'll go from there. Hallelujah. We'll pray then. So, uh, let's go to Leviticus, the 27th chapter, verse 32. And here's where our first introduction is to passing under the rod. And beloved, we're all going to pass under his rod today, this morning. We're going to pass under his rod. You have your Bibles, choir? Yes, good. Everyone, wonderful. Verse 32, And concerning the tithe of the herd or of the flock, even of whatsoever passeth under the rod, the tent shall be holy unto the Lord. All right, hear it again. And concerning the tithe of the herd or of the flock, even of whatsoever passeth under the rod, the tent shall be holy unto the Lord. Holy Spirit, I ask you to come upon me with might and power and authority. I have nothing of myself, but through Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Ghost, the word shall go forth, unadulterated, pure, and holy. Sanctify me, Jesus. Purge me. I take your authority over every demon power, every principality and power of darkness, because nothing, nothing shall hinder the word of God from going forth today. Nothing. God, let us have ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts that are open to hear the living word of God. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. All right, I've introduced to you now a Holy Ghost concept called the tithing rod. All the flock of a sheep, if someone was going to tithe his flock, and all flocks, all herds had to be tithed, they would take the herd into the sheep coat, and there'd be a narrow door, and there would be a tenth sacrificed unto the Lord, given unto the Lord. The tenth was tapped and given to the Levites. It was a holy, uh, uh, the, the, there was a rod that the Levite had, a long rod, and he dipped it in vermilion, that's red paint, or okra, and every tenth was tapped with that red paint and belonged unto the Lord. In fact, the rabbinate describes it like this. When a man was to give the tithe of his sheep or calves to God, he was to shut up the whole flock in one fold, in which there was one narrow door capable of letting out one sheep at a time. The owner stood by the door with a rod in his hand, the end of which was dipped in vermilion or red ochre, when the tenth one came, he touched it with the red color, and it was received as the legitimate tithe. He was not to see whether it was strong, weak, or anything else. Even if it was a weak one, it would pass through, and God would touch it, it would belong unto the Lord. Now, I want you to go to Ezekiel 20, and you're going to see prophetically how this is prophesied to happen in every generation, especially the last day. Ezekiel, the 20th chapter. Ezekiel 20. Folks, we're going to go through a lot of scriptures, so bear with us. Ezekiel 20. You might want to write these scriptures down as you go. I hope you have a pen. Ezekiel, the 20th chapter. Now, I want you to go to verse 37, please. Verse 37. I hear the leaves still rustling. I'll wait for just a moment. Ezekiel 20, verse 37. Here it is. I will cause you... What? to pass under the rod. And I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. I will cause you to pass under the rod. All right, God's going to shep separate sheep from sheep. Go over to Ezekiel 34. Turn right, Ezekiel 34. Let's begin verse 22. Let's go to verse 20. Ezekiel 34, verse 20. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God unto them, Behold, I, even I, will judge between the fat cattle and between the lean cattle, because you have thrust with the side and with shoulder and pushed all the diseased with your horns to have scattered them abroad. Verse 22. Therefore will I save my flock, and they shall be no more prey, and I will judge between cattle and cattle. How many see that? I will judge between cattle and and cattle. Now, folks, something is awesome and terrific, uh, terrifying is happening here in what I've read to you now. He's judging between sheep and sheep. Now, I want you to know before I go any further that many Christians are not going to heaven. Those who call themselves Christian, many who believe they are sheep, are not going to be saved. They are not going to have the red touch of God's mark. They're not going to be tapped. Only a remnant, the Bible says, only a remnant. If every generation, only a remnant has come through. 
And this is very important to understand. And the Lord now says, I'm going to gather my people. Now remember, there's a final judgment day when we all stand before God. But he said before then, judgment will begin in the house of God. There's a judgment that begins before the final judgment, and that judgment is already underway, beginning in the house of God and among the ministry and then all over the body of Jesus Christ. And that is happening now. He said he's going to gather his sheep into a valley of decision. Now, folks, many have believed that the valley of decision is whether or not you or I am going to decide to follow Jesus. That's not what the valley of decision is about at all. The valley of decision is the decision he's going to make, who is going to be tapped, who passing under the rod is going to get the mark. The valley of decision is his decision, it's not ours. It's those whose hearts are perfect toward him, those that he sees and he says, that's mine, tap, put the mark on, that is mine. That sheep belongs to me, that sheep is going to green pastures, and we'll talk about where it goes. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. Joel 3, 14 and 16. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon will grow dark, the stars will lose their brightness, and the Lord will roar out of, out of Zion. And that's exactly, he said he's coming, and Yahweh will judge. Yahweh is Jehovah. Now, why are all these being gathered right now to be judged? Look at Ezekiel 20. Go back to Ezekiel 20. I want you to turn, uh, read verse 33, begin with verse 33 now. And here's the picture. Get this picture in your mind, please. As I live, saith the Lord God, surety with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out, will I rule over you. I will bring you out from the people, will gather you, the countries wherein you are scattered with a mighty hand, with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the people. And there will I plead with you face to face, like as I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness of the hand of Egypt, land of Egypt. And so I will plead with you, saith the Lord, and I will there cause you to pass under the rod, and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. Look at me, please. God says in the last day, and this is uh, Jeremiah saw it, Isaiah saw it, Ezekiel saw it, all the prophets saw a gathering of God's people before the final judgment, where the Lord would decide who were His. And some would be cast into a situation that will be described as we go on a little further here today. Now, of course, the day is coming. We all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. There's a great gathering. Every one of us must appear before God in Zion, according to Psalms 84, 7. But Christ is gathering his church right now in the wilderness of judgment. He's going to undertake a one-on-one, -on -one, face to face judgment. He said, I shall judge you face to face, Ezekiel 20, 35. As I entered into judgment with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so I will enter into judgment with you, declares the Lord God. And I'm telling you that that judgment has already begun. For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel? The judgment first in the house of God. The Lord arises to contend, and he arises to judge his own people. The Lord enters into judgment with his elders and the princes of the people. And the reason was because they have what I call the spirit of Herod, who heard John the Baptist gladly, but obeyed nothing he said. And the Lord says there are going to be many in the last days who come and love to hear the prophets. They love to hear the watchmen warn. They love to hear the sound of powerful preaching. They love it in their hearts, but they go out and disobey, and it never changes their lives. God is now contending with his household because nothing seems to move many of his children anymore. The trumpets are sounding of the prophets. The watchmen are crying out their warnings. The end of all things is at hand, and yet the majority of God's people are still at ease. They are not hearing the word of God. And God says, I've had enough, and I'm going to bring my people into judgment. I'm going to bring them, and I'm going to search their hearts. And he's now contending with his household. Why don't you go left to Ezekiel 7. Ezekiel 7. Verse 1. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Also, thou son of man, thus saith the Lord God unto the land of Israel, an end 
The end is come upon the four corners of the land. Now is the end come upon thee, and I will send mine anger upon thee, and will judge thee according to thy ways, and will recompense upon thee all thine abominations. And my eyes shall not spare thee, neither will I have pity, but I will recompense thy ways upon thee, and thy abominations shall be in the midst of thee. You shall know that I am the Lord God. Look at verse 14. Speaking of the watchmen and the prophets, they have blown the trumpet even to make all ready, but none goeth to the battle, for my wrath is upon all the multitude thereof. Folks, look around you. What do you hear? What are you hearing in your spirit? As one who says, I'm a child of God, what are you hearing? Are you hearing the trumpets? Are you hearing what the prophets are saying? Are you seeing what's happening to the nation and the world? Wars and rumors of wars all over. Yugoslavia is gone. Russia is torn apart. Ethnic wars all over the face of the earth. Are you hearing the sound of the trumpet? The watchman is warned. I've stood in this pulpit now for seven years as a watchman. I've heard people say there's no prophetic message from this pulpit. There's been an everlasting prophetic message from this pulpit. There's a prophetic message going out to your heart this very moment. You've been listening to the watchmen. The watchmen are warning. They're sending letters. They're sending messages. They're on radio. They're everywhere warning that the end has come. Judgment is at the door. Our nation is collapsing right under our noses. Why are people sitting in front of their television sets laughing? Why are people no more awake? Why are people still lazy and not seeking the face of God? Do you hear the sound of the trumpet? I hear it in my heart. I've heard it and I'll never stop hearing it. God help us when we quit hearing the sound of the trumpet. He said the trumpets are blaring, but people are not going out to the battle. Why aren't Christians forsaking their idols? I want you to go to Ezekiel 8. You said you love the word, beloved? Verse 17. Then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence. They've returned to provoke me to anger. And lo, they put the branch to their nose. Therefore also I will deal in fury. My eyes shall not spare, neither will I have pity. And though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, yet will I not hear them. Look at me, folks. Here's what the prophet is saying. He said, the warnings have gone forth. God has proclaimed that he's coming soon. He's proclaimed the warning. The watchmen have warned. But the people who are holding on to their sins were, were putting a twig to their nose. And in, in those days in this society, the worst thing that you could do to show disrespect was to pick up a twig, hold it under your nose and flip it. Now, we don't use the twig. We use the thumb. And what God's saying, my people are thumbing their nose at me. They're thumbing their nose at my word and my warnings. They're not listening. They're putting the twig to their nose. For they have filled the land with violence and have returned to provoke me to anger. And they put the brands to their nose. They put the brands to their nose. Now, none of us believe that we're like that. None of us believe. But folks, when you hear the word and don't obey the word and just let it slots off and go your own way, it's putting a thumb to your nose at God. That's what the scriptures are. You're thumbing your nose at me. The Lord says, come out from among them, be ye separate and clean. Touch not the unclean thing and have no fellowship with the works of darkness. Shun the very appearance of evil. Love not the world nor the things that are in the world. And yet we still have Christians who know that and sit under Holy Ghost preaching and can sit in the presence of an awesome God and the Lord Jesus can be manifesting His presence and they walk right out and they're not married and yet they're going to bed with their sweethearts. There are Christians that come to this church and go to some of the dirtiest, filthiest movies in this city. I don't know how you can say that you are not thumbing your nose at God when you can sit and watch any kind of a movie where God's name is taken in vain, where the name of Jesus Christ is mocked and ridiculed, and you sit there and you take it. You don't walk out of that movie. You're thumbing your nose at him, he said. You're thumbing your nose at him. Porno, lust, gossip, slander, 
singing about light while still walking in darkness. God said, I'll deal with you in anger, not sparing, no pity. I'll put an end to this abomination. And the prophet Ezekiel had a vision of that marking of sheep in the spiritual realm. I want you to go to Ezekiel 9 now. And I want to show you another marking that's awesome. Ezekiel 9. He cried also in my ears with a loud voice saying, Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near, even every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north, and every man with a, a slaughter weapon in his hand. Now look at this, folks. There's six angels there, and they have slaughtering weapons in their hands. But one man among them was clothed with linen, with a writer's inkhorn by his side, and they went in and stood beside the brazen altar. And the glory of the Lord God of Israel was gone up from the cherub, whereupon he was, to the threshing hold of the house. And he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the writer's inkhorn by his side. The Lord said unto him, Go to the midst of the city, to the midst of Jerusalem, Set a mark upon the foreheads of who? Of the men that sigh and that cry over all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And to the others he said in my hearing, Go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women. But not, come not near any man upon whom is the mark. And begin at my sanctuary. Then they begin at the ancient men which were before the house. Folks, look at me, please. That never happened literally, will never happen literally ever. This is a spiritual picture. The prophet Ezekiel is seeing down the quarters of time to our very day. And there are six men, six angels are going forth because God is judging his people now. He's marking those who belong to him. He said, I want you to go through the city. The city is the city of God. That's us, the new Jerusalem, those who claim to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. And the Lord is saying, go through this people. Go among them and find those whose hearts are sighing and crying over the sins in this house. The sins of the world, the sins of God's people, the sins of their own heart. Go put a mark on their forehead because they are mine. And so the angel of the Lord goes through the whole place and he puts a mark on the foreheads of those that belong to him, who sigh and cry of the abominations. First of all, the abomination of their own hearts. Folks, I have never been able to preach against sin in this pulpit till I've examined my own heart before God. And there has to be in every one of us the examining of our hearts. There has to be an openness to the Lord. Because, beloved, he's coming to mark those who sigh and cry first over their own abominations, and then over the abominations in the church and in the abominations in the land and in the world itself. Do you sigh and cry over those abominations? Are you sighing and crying over your own? But then he says, those who are not marked have no pity, don't spare, and put the slaughtering mark upon them. Now, folks, what that means spiritually is a slaughtered life. It means a life of despair, despondency, depression. A terrible slaughtering, a slumbering, blind sheep passing under the rod one by one. Now, folks, I want you to get this picture. Ezekiel sees it. Jeremiah saw it. And I'm seeing it, and I want you to see this picture. <clears throat> We're gathered in this one great sheepfold. And there's one door. And the Holy Ghost stands there. Jesus is watching the sheep go by. And the sheep are going under the rod. Because the rod is just stretched out. It, it falls and taps certain ones. And here come the sheep passing by. And the, the shepherd would, could be pastor. He said, no, 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 That mock that one. What, what a wonderful person. And the Lord says, no. He prophesied, he cast out demons, he did mighty works. I don't even know him. Pass it. Yeah, but Lord, she prophesied, she spoke in tongues. She looked so holy. 
She's full of bitterness. Yes. Here they come, one after another, they go by. And every once in a while, down comes the rod and the red paint on the sheep. They're passing by. The Lord said, no, the Holy Spirit said, no, don't mark that one. Slander. Gossip. Never will change. Move. But Lord, he's a preacher. He preaches with such fire. The strong man was never bound. He gave his sins, but he didn't bind the strong man. Move him. There's so many going by, Ezekiel cries. Lord, too many righteous, too many are going by. Are you going to damn them all? Go to Ezekiel 20. Verse 37. And I will cause you to pass under the rod and I'll bring you into the bond of the covenant and I will purge out from among you the rebels and them that transgress against me. I'll bring them forth out of the country where they sojourn and they shall not enter the land of Israel and you shall know that I am the Lord. As for you, O house of Israel, thus saith the Lord God, go you, serve every one to his idols. Because you see, those sheep that are not being marked, he says, send them out. Let them go to their idols. They won't change. Let them alone. Jeremiah, all you're preaching, Ezekiel, all you're preaching can't affect them anymore. Let them go. Let them go to their, let them go out to the mountains and to the rocks. Let them go out to their shattered lives. But they're not mine. Go, you serve everyone his idols, and hereafter also, if ye will hearken unto me, but pollute ye my holy name no more with your gifts and with your idols. I want you to go to Ezekiel 9. Verse 8. Let, let's start with verse 6. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men which were before the house. And he said unto them, Defile the house and fill the courts with the slain. Verse 8. It came to pass while well, they were slaying them, and I was left. I fell upon my face and cried and said, O oh Lord God, will thou destroy all the residue of Israel in the pouring out of thy fury upon Jerusalem? Then said he unto me, The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceedingly great, and is full of blood in the city of perverseness. And they said, The Lord hath forsaken the earth, and the Lord seeth not. Ezekiel's crying out, O oh God. So few are being marked. So few, so few were being marked. Are you going to slay them all? The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is very great, and it's filled with blood. And the Lord commanded the marking angel to begin in the sanctuary. God showed Malachi that the ministry first would be melted and purified, and he will sit as a smelter and a purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi, refine them like gold and silver so that they may be presented to the Lord an offering in righteousness. And folks, that purifying process is happening in all of us right now, whether we want to acknowledge it or not. I want you to go to Jeremiah 6. Because some people who are going to be purified and put in the fire 
are going to hold on to their iniquity, and the Lord is going to reject them even though they go through the fire. Jeremiah 6. Now, folks, I want you to get this picture clear in your mind, if you will, please. Beginning verse 27, Jeremiah 6. I have set thee for a tower and a fortress among my people, that thou mayest know and to try them. The Lord said, I'm going to test my people. They're all grievous revolters walking with slanders. They are brass and iron. They are corruptors. The bellows are burned. The Lord said, I'm going to turn up the fire. I'm going to heat it with my bellows. The lead is consumed. He's putting us into the fire. And the founder melteth it in vain, for the wicked are not plucked out. In other words, the wickedness of the heart is not surrendered. Reprobate silver shall men call them, because the Lord hath rejected them. Now, folks, that's a picture of many people going to be tested and going into the fire, and they're not going to let go of their, of their sins. They're not going to let go. And the Lord says they're going to be rejected because they can't be refined anymore. They are rejected silver, according to the Scripture. Look at Jeremiah, go to Jeremiah 8. Verse 5 and 6. Why then is this people of Jerusalem backslidden back by a perpetual backsliding? They hold fast to seat, they refuse to return. I hearkened and heard, but they spake not aright. No man repented him of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? Everyone turned to his course as the horse rushes to the battle. The Lord says, there, there will be a people in the last days who don't acknowledge any sin whatsoever. Say, what have I done? God help me. God help all of us to acknowledge our sins before the Lord, before we pass under the rod. And folks, the Bible talks about a dread release, that there are going to be some. I know people don't like to hear this, but you know he said not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of God. And that there's going to be a blindness, there's going to be a deception fall upon many, many Christians. God help us, I've got to, to, to get this through to your spirit somehow. I want you to go to Ezekiel 20 again, back to Ezekiel 20. Look at verse 38 again. I will purge out from among you the rebels and them that transgress against me. Now, folks, that's often rebellion in our own hearts. It's a spiritual condition that many of us are going through. I will bring them forth out of the country where they sojourn, and they shall not enter the land of Israel. You shall know that I'm the Lord. The Lord says they're not going to go into fullness whatsoever. And God talks about giving them over to a dread release, to a shattered life. Remember what the Scripture says in Romans that there were a people who knew God but didn't acknowledge Him as God. And they had a form of godliness without the power. And he says God gave them over to reprobate minds. He gave them over to reprobate men who once knew God. But they were filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, gossip. Without understanding, unloving, unmerciful, insolent, arrogant, boasters, disobedient, and vendors of evil. Folks, that's the shattered life that people are given over to when they pass out of this sheepfold into this shattered way of living. But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossipers, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness without power. Gave a whole see in church over to a dread release. He said, because you're neither hot or cold, I'll spew you out of my mouth. God just gave them over. He gave a whole church over to a dread release. He said, no, you say you don't have need, you don't see your need. He said, I turn you over. He spit them out of his mouth. And I say, there are millions of sin-bound Christians are going to go to hell, including men who claim, many who claim to be spirit-filled because their lives mock holiness. There's no brokenness. But folks, I want to 
tell you that God's going to have a remnant in the last days. He's going to have a holy remnant. And when they pass through, the Lord, the Holy Spirit says, Mark it. Mark him. Mark her. And down comes the rod. Marks. And these who are marked go with the shepherd into green pastures. They're, they're held here on the side till all are marked. And they're led off to green pastures because the word rod here in Hebrew is shebet, the same word used in the rod of Psalm 23. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Because those whose hearts are right with God, who sigh and cry with their abominations, who acknowledge their sins, are walking in righteousness before the Lord. The Lord knows them and He's going to mark them. And they're going to follow that rod. They don't fear that rod. That rod's a comfort to them because it marked them. And that rod is going to lead them into green pastures beside still waters. It's the same word, that same rod. Folks, if you're walking in righteousness, you need not fear judgment. You need not sit here and fear my preaching. You need not hear, fear any man's preaching. If your heart is right with God, if your ear is clean, your heart is clean, there's no poison in your system, you never, never fear. You should rejoice in what I'm preaching right now because your heart is right with God and you know when you pass under the rod. That blood red, that red is the blood of Jesus Christ. And there are many who've claimed the blood of Jesus Christ. They've given up sex, they've given up lust, they've given up habits, but they've never bound the strong man, Satan himself. He has to be bound and then he will spoil his goods. Have you had Satan bound in your spirit? Have you had him bound in your heart? Oh, hallelujah. Verse 40, chapter 20 of Ezekiel. For in my holy mountain, in the mountains of the height of Israel, saith the Lord, there shall the house of Israel, all of them of the land, serve me. I will accept them, and, the, I, and there will I require your offerings and first fruits. I will accept you with your sweet savor, and I will bring you out from the people and gather you out of the countries where you've been scattered, and sanctify you before the heathen. God says, I'm going to have a holy remnant that are going to be my testimony before the heathen in the last days. They're going to be marked. And you know where they're going to follow him? Song of Solomon, my beloved has gone down to his garden, to the beds of balsam, to pasture his flocks in the gardens. I'm my beloved's and my beloved is mine. He who pastures his flock is among the lilies. Hallelujah. I wonder how many in this house, I wonder how many of you are going to be led. You're going to be passing under the rod and you're going to be marked because the Lord says, He... She has no other desire but me. There's one who's not looking to people. There's one who's not looking to anyone but me. There's one who's totally dependent and cast upon me. Who's clean hands and pure heart, and spirit, and mind, and body. This is mine. This is the holy remnant that's going to rise in the last days. Sighing and crying over the abominations. And the Lord's going to use that holy remnant to be his example in the last day, to be his testimony. Folks, I don't know about you, but I, I don't have time for any of the foolishness anymore because I want his mark on my forehead. I want to be marked by that precious lamb. I want the Holy Spirit to bring that rod down on my back. I want that mark on my neck. Ezekiel twenty forty three, And here's the real testimony Folks, here's whether you can tell whether or not you've received the mark. And these shall, uh, verse 42 first, You shall know that I am the Lord when I shall bring you into land, into the country which I lifted up my hand to give to your fathers. There shall ye remember your ways and all your doings wherein you have defiled. You shall loathe yourself in your own sight for all your evils that you've committed. Folks, that's repentance. That's total repentance. You look at your life and so God point out anything that's unlike you and loathe it. You make all your wrongs right and you don't walk among the people as if you're some holy righteous person. You go among the people in your own weakness because that's when his strength is made perfect. 
and you loathe yourself, you loathe your sins, and you live in that loathing. Oh God, by your grace alone, you saved me. By your grace alone. I'm no better than anybody else. I'm no better than the worst sinner in this city, except by the blood of the Lamb, and because my heart has been made to reach out to you, oh God. Love it, we're passing under the rod. You know what uh, shook me up? I was reading Paul, what Paul said to the church. He said that I may present you as a chaste virgin. Now, for, he didn't say as a virgin. There are a lot of virgins. Remember, there were ten virgins and five were lost. It's not enough to be a virgin. In other words, you say, I belong to Jesus. Because you can be a virgin and still lust. You may not have committed the act, but you lust in your mind. But you see, he didn't say, I want to present you as a virgin. I'm not interested in presenting you as a virgin to Christ alone. He said, a chaste virgin, absolutely pure in mind and body and spirit. But I may present you a chaste virgin. Folks, this is not a popularity contest. It has nothing to do with personalities. God called me to New York City for one purpose. And he empowered me to do it. And that's to raise up a chaste bride. Holy and pure and sanctified. I'm not here to get you to love me or I'd love to be loved. I'm not here to in a popularity contest or get anybody to love me. I have to stand before a holy God. I have to have my own hands clean and pure. I'll stand against slander. I'll stand against anything. But I will not let anything hinder me from my call to present you as a chaste virgin before a holy God. You have to stand before Christ. I'll suffer anything. I'll go through anything. But I'm going to stand before you on the judgment. I have to be there as a shepherd. And if this is your church and you belong here, I'm a shepherd. And I have to be called before God and I'm going to be there when you pass under that rod. And many of you would like to see touched. I'd say, God, no, please don't let that go. Don't let her go. Don't let him go. Please, Lord, that's my friend. That's my loved one. That's Don't let it happen. And I can't stop it. I can only go up to the point where you pass. And you and I are going to pass under a rod. Say what you will about me. I will stand here between you and hell. Between you and the devil. And I'm not going to let you go without a fight. And you're going to know when you stand before God. There were shepherds in this pulpit who fought every demon in hell for you. Who fought against all the principalities and powers. And gave you the truth. And prophesied to you. And gave you the holy word of God. And stood before you and hell itself and said, Stop! Because I don't want you to pass under that rod and go screaming out into a wilderness of despair. The sad thing is some of you will never change. No matter what I preach, no matter who preaches, you won't change. Because you've already committed. But he said those who loathe their sins and hate them. David said, yes, for God, they're under the blood. He forgets, but I don't. David said, my sin is ever before me. I can't forget anything I've done against him. And I loathe my past. I loathe everything I did against him. And that keeps me broken before him. Do I make mistakes? You bet I do. The one thing I know... God sent me here. God set up this house as a testimony to the whole world that in the last days there will be a godly, pure, and holy people who live in Babylon, who live in one of the worst cities in the world and have clean hands and a pure heart. Hallelujah. And walk in repentance. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Bless you, Jesus. <clears throat> Do you need to repent? Balcony, main floor. Do you need to repent? Can you pass under the rod this morning? Are you really sure the rod comes down with that red mark? Oh, God, help you to examine your heart. God, examine us by the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come. Examine us. Search our hearts. Oh, God, don't let us say, what have I done? Don't let us have done nothing. Let us say, oh, God, I loathe myself in your presence. Show me my iniquities. Show me the air of my ways, oh, God. Hallelujah. And heal this afternoon. Heal this morning. Bring great healing. Bring restoration. Lord, you want to heal every broken heart in this place this morning. We stand. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to open the altars. If you need repentance, come on. Just get out of your seat. Balcony, go to either stairs on the other side and just come. And when you come up here, just pour your heart out. Say, Jesus, help me. Oh, God, cleanse me. Purge me. Sanctify me. I repent. Lord, I repent. If you have sin, if you sinned against God or your brother, Move in closer. A lot of people coming. Move in real close, if you will, please. Please move in tight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, pass us under your rod and mark us. Put a mark on our foreheads, Lord. Put a mark on our neck. <laughs> Folks in the standard, don't let me put words in your mouth. Come on, have it out with God. You know what to do. Lord, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Come on, call on him right now. God, come by your, your grace and your mercy. He's merciful. If you'll cry out, God, forgive me. Lord, forgive me and heal me. Oh, Jesus, help us as we pass under the rod. Lord, don't pass us by. Don't pass us by this morning. Hallelujah. Don't pass this by, Lord. <laughs> you that have come forward, raise both hands to the Lord. Lift it up. Lift up to the Lord. Lift up your hands. The Bible says, would every man lift holy hands? All right, lift your hands. Pray this prayer with me right now. Jesus, Jesus. I need your touch. Jesus. I need your forgiveness. I, need your forgiveness. I, repent, I repent of all wickedness, all of all rebellion, all of all slander. All if anything, it's son like you. Amen. Cleanse me, Jesus. Oh God, I want to be yours. I want to be your sheep. I want to be of your fold. Fill my heart. Touch me. Touch me today. Because I need you. And I'm reaching to you, Lord. And I have truly repented with all my heart. Now reach out and just love him because he's faithful to forgive us and cleanse us. Lord, forgive and cleanse and heal now your people. Heal and sanctify and purge by your grace, Lord. Do a wonderful work in hearts. <clears throat> Do a wonderful work in hearts. Lord, I pray right now there be true repentance. True repentance. Hallelujah. Lord, take all rebellion out of our hearts against you. Lord, we're not rebel against you. 
we thank you, Lord, that you take everything that's of this world out. Those, Lord, who are bound by sin, break the power of that sin. We come against principalities and powers of darkness. We come against lying spirits who would try to hold people in their lust. Break those spirits of lust. Break those chains that bind. Break them, O oh God. Let there be a freedom in the house of God. Freedom against all sin. Now, will you just thank him in your own words? Just give him thanks. Lord, I thank you for hearing me. I thank you for answering me. I give you glory. And I give you praise. This is the conclusion of the message.